On the magnificent planet we call Earth, forests represent one of the most perfect systems. The best evidence we have suggests that over billions of years, the Earth was transformed from a molten rock into a beautiful garden. The air we breathe and the water cycle we depend on were created by, continuously filtered, and constantly renewed by biological life. As each generation of life lays down its body in death, the decaying organic matter and minerals from geologic materials form a living soil, a habitat for insects and microbes that transmits nutrients and water to the next generation. Life has evolved in wondrous diversity, with species specially adapted to their environments, often depending on how much water was available. Many relatively water-scarce ecosystems, including grasslands, forest savanna, steppe, thicket, and subtropical dry forest, among others, are collectively known as drylands. Drylands can be found on every continent, and cover over 32% of the Earth's terrestrial surface. If deserts are included, then the percentage rises to over 40%. Asia has the largest total area of drylands with 18 million square kilometers. Nearly 50% of the African continent is covered by drylands. Vast numbers of people live in drylands including nearly 30% of the population of South America. But was it always like this? What makes land become dry? When I was 10, my friends and I used to drink wonderful spring water. We used to play in the locust tree groves and we could swim in the reservoir. From 94 and 95, more seriously in 97, 98 and 99, and especially in the spring sandstorm this year, 2000, it was fierce. The sand started covering everything. In the past, there wasn't any sand here. This was all grass. According to the International Union for the Conservation of Nature and the United Nations Development Program, 70% of the world's drylands have been degraded. What you see here is replicated around the world. Hundreds of millions of people farm for survival and degrade fragile environments, and this is expected to get worse with climate change and population growth. The fate of these people and the fate of the environment are intimately intertwined. If this goes on for yet more decades and generations, the outcomes will become more and more dire. This is a problem begging for a solution. It's a very old story. Tree cutting, unsustainable agriculture, and free-ranging of goats and sheep, now compounded by new mechanized ways to speed the destruction. Where we have reduced biodiversity, reduced biomass, and interrupted the accumulation of organic matter, we have also altered the ability of nature to naturally regulate the hydrological cycle, the weather, and the climate. In 1995, I was asked by the World Bank to begin to document one extensively degraded area in China, the Lus Plateau. Over the years, this inquiry has expanded worldwide. One thing that became apparent early on is the connection between damaged environments and human poverty. In many parts of the world, there's been a vicious cycle. Continuous use of the land has led to subsistence agriculture. And generation by generation, this has further degraded the soils. The vital question we have to ask is, can this destructive process be reversed? When I first filmed Mr. Ta Fu Yuan and his colleagues back in 1995, I had no idea this initiative could achieve such dramatic results.
The effort that people put into converting their slopes into terraces has resulted in a marked increase in agricultural productivity. The higher yields are directly related to the return of natural vegetation in the surrounding ecological land. The restoration of the Luce Plateau has shown that we don't have to settle for degraded ecosystems. This lesson can be seen in every continent. I'm in Baviansklove, or the Valley of the Baboons. This is near Port Elizabeth in South Africa. It's a reserve, which is a World Heritage Site, and it's got three biodiversity hotspots, and here, clear, beautiful streams are flowing out of the hills. And this water is flowing out of the hills because it's been captured and infiltrated and retained by the natural vegetation here on the hillsides. But just outside the reserve, there are vast areas where for three generations, farmers have been removing the natural vegetation. And in those areas, you see severely degraded lands, which are massively affected by drought. To address the degradation, the South African government, African and international academics and students, have created the Participatory Restoration of Ecosystem Services and Natural Capital in the Eastern Cape, or PRESENCE. This innovative program is bringing together the government, farmers, farm workers, academics and students in a learning network. By synthesizing the indigenous knowledge of the local farming community, the presence participants have learned the importance of a unique endemic plant, Portolacaria afra, called speckboom in Afrikaans, anchors a diverse range of plant life, helping to restore degraded land into a functioning system. Behind me is subtropical thicket. This is a specialized dryland forest ecosystem found mainly in South Africa. This system is extremely important. The canopy and the vegetation infiltrate and retain rainfall. The root systems prevent erosion. The accumulation of organic matter in the biomass itself all sequester carbon. And this is habitat for some of the most endangered species on the planet. The Learning Village houses a very professional nursery system that propagates mainly indigenous and endemic species, including large amounts of speck boom, which is then transplanted by working for water teams onto the degraded slopes. Working for water is part of a government employment program that includes working for wetlands and working for woodlands, providing training and income for people who need jobs in work that benefits the local community and global ecological health. If the ecology is intact, this is a beautiful place. And, 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 and that becomes a value to uh, the land users. Secondly, another link to the ecology, this area um, has got the ability to generate a huge amount of carbon in, in, in the context of a, a, an arid or semi-arid to arid uh, landscape. The scientists at Presence are continuously studying and monitoring how the region's vegetation and water interact. Already the Learning Network has inspired 40 master's degrees and 10 PhDs. The data being gathered does much more than generate a degree. It is immediately useful to serve the community and protect the ecosystem. The Learning Network is also proving useful to help the next generation to learn about the environment in which they live and how to protect it. We need to consider why it is that the ruins of once great civilizations are found in drylands and realize that unless we learn the lessons of history, we are destined to repeat them. In drylands, 
we have the opportunity to actively employ a strategy of both mitigating and adapting to the worst impacts of biodiversity loss, desertification, and climate change. Returning indigenous and endemic vegetation to degraded landscapes helps nature to regulate the hydrological cycle, sequesters large amounts of carbon, increases fertility in the soil and productivity in agriculture, strengthening the resilience of the land and reducing the risk from extreme weather. Once the majority of the world's drylands were covered by forests but now many are degraded. In restoring them, we have the opportunity to provide meaningful employment for vast numbers of people in work that is of urgent importance for humanity and the earth. The only way we can address the problems we face is to design solutions that are appropriate to the size of the problems. Restoring drylands provides the chance for humanity to act as a species on a planetary scale to secure our common future. <laughs>